Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Dustro Auto Channel. This is a place where we talk about that wonderful genre of science fiction, steampunk, which is like a me melding of speculation with historical fiction. And partly, partly because of that, and my great interest in history, we've also ventured into topics of history and historical interest, which is another one of the things I love to talk about. So that's what we're going to do today. And this is inspired by current events. And my source material here is a book that I purchased back in the 1990s. The book is called Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. It was first published in 1841 by Charles McKay, LLD, a doctor of law, also a Scottish journalist. And it was republished in 1852, originally in three volumes. The one I have here was republished by Barnes & Noble in 1993. And as you can see, there's a the cover has an illustration of some uh, witch, witch hunters and uh, things relevant to the witch mania, which is one of the things that Mackay talks about in this book. On the back, we have a reference to the South Sea Bubble, which was kind of an economic speculation gone frenzied, which brought a lot of people to bankruptcy. Uh, kind of reminiscent of the dot-com bubble, for example, around 2000, when internet companies that had never produced anything or shown any profits were selling for hundreds of dollars a share. That didn't last long, as these economic bubbles seldom do. Anyway, um, Mackey's book, or Mackey's book, I found it completely fascinating. And though it's really long, I, I love to read uh, tales like this, and more, more powerful still because they're true. And he had basically compiled these as examples of the things that can happen when people uh, fall prey to mob psychology and groupthink. To quote from his introduction, Popular delusions began so early, spread so widely, and have lasted so long that instead of two or three volumes, 50 would hardly suffice to detail the history. So he said that the three-volume set, which in my copy was compiled into one volume, um, were, were a miscellany rather than a history, and it was just a, a by way of examples that he found of popular manias. And again, to quote, Okay, men, it has been well said, think in herds. It will be seen that they go mad in herds while they only recover their senses slowly and one by one. So this particular edition details 16 ideas or um, fads, whatever. It, it has 16 different chapters. And all are fascinating and worth, worth exploring, but I'm going to talk about seven of them so I can give a little bit more... Uh, more um, attention to them, and some of the others are like repetitions or similar. So, in a way, some of them are a little bit repetitive. As, as they say, history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. So, first incident is the tulip mania. A lot of people have heard of this. It happened in the Netherlands in mostly in the early 17th century, when tulip bulbs when tulips, the flower tulip, grows from a bulb rather than a seed, uh, became an op object of speculation. They were introduced, tulips were introduced into Europe from the Ottoman Empire and around 1550, and they became vastly popular, and uh, Europeans were breeding them and producing different colors and varieties that were very beautiful. And it they became very pricey, and the speculation started happening as if, you know, something like when we see Bitcoin soaring to $10,000 in a day. That's the way things were with tulips. Anyway, it says, by 1635, a sale of 40 bulbs, 40 tulip bulbs, was recorded for 100,000 florins. And uh, a florin probably the equivalent of like 12 to 15 dollars today, so that's well over a million dollars for 40 bulbs. 
By way of comparison, a skilled laborer at that time might earn between 150 and 350 florins a year. Just that, that's all. And uh, you could buy eight fat hogs for 240 florins. <laughs> so, so all these, these bulbs were worth, you know, a million tons of pork. <laughs> And so, after all this trading, people mortgaging their homes and everything, eventually people realized that th this was way overpriced and it was never going to last. And in 1637, the bubble burst. The tulip market crashed and, and thousands upon thousands of people were bankrupt. And, um, <clears throat> and, uh, and though it was, it was a lesson that people never quite learned because this kind of thing has re been repeated even into the 21st century. Maybe not to quite that extent, but the Dutch never lost their love of tulips and it's still known, the Netherlands is still known as a land of tulips today. So I guess they have a bit of a sense of humor about that. Number two, witchcraft and more specifically the persecution of witches. Now, people have believed for many, many millennia that, that there are such a thing as sorcerer, sorcerers and witches that deal with dark powers and as such have these supernatural abilities and, and they're dangerous and they do all these evil things. And in Europe, the witchcraft mania became, um, became really pronounced in the 16th and 17th century, which is what McKay focuses on. And uh, he's basically saying this was a time when ill fortune, including you know, ill health and illnesses, for example, were often attributed to the supernatural. And they were also say, well, so-and-so is a witch and she's poisoning my well or something like that. McKay also notes that a lot of these cases when people were accused of witchcraft was really people settling scores. That they were, that they had a grudge against somebody and this was a handy dandy way to get somebody out of the picture. And indeed, the evidence that they required to convict somebody of witchcraft was really, really slim. In fact, I recall, and it may have been in this book, where they mentioned that it was believed that witches could be in two places at one time. So therefore, an alibi was not an alibi. Just because a woman was asleep in bed with her husband didn't mean she wasn't also, at the same time, celebrating uh, the Sabbath in, under the moonlight with Satan. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, it, it took you know it took till almost till almost the 1700s for people to wise up and know this wasn't real. And in a way that so people, thousands upon thousands of people were executed as witches over two and a half centuries, with the largest numbers killed in Germany and Spain. Interestingly, interestingly enough, in Spain, the church or the government, I believe, would take possession of the pro former property of the witches, which was a good reason, I guess, a good incentive to uh, bring Spurgus charges. Number three, the Crusades. Now this is, I mean, some of Mackey's, Mackey's topics are pretty minor and short-lived. The Crusades are something rather that were, were tremendous, took place over centuries, and a, a very momentous uh, event that cost many, many thousands of lives and, uh, and very much impacted history. Uh, Mackey describes the history of the Crusades as kind of a mania starting in the Middle Ages, uh, when, when European pilgrims were going to the Holy Land, um, now Israel slash Palestine, and uh, the uh, Muslims and the, the Ottoman Turks um, eventually, I believe, well I believe it was the Arabs first, but then the Ottoman Turks conquered that, and they were, you know, demanding or restricting uh, Christian pilgrims to some degree, and they saw that as a great offense, so they went to conquer the Holy Land. According to Mackey, and I'm quoting, Europe expended millions on her tre of her treasures, the blood of two millions of her children, and a, handful of, and a handful of knights retained possession of Palestine for only about a hundred years. <laughs> so it didn't work out so well. The, the craziest, most, there was a couple things that were really insane. And one was the fact that Catholic crusaders that went through Constantinople sacked the city not, not recognizing that they were fellow Christians because they were Orthodox and not Catholic. <laughs> and this weakened Constantinople such that it later fell to 
the uh, Turks who almost ended up taking over Vienna. <laughs> so it was a bad, stupid thing to do. Secondly was the Chris Children's Crusade, uh, kind of the most insidious fraud where they believed that children from their innocence would be able to conquer uh, Palestine for the Christians when, of course, they were basically uh, all captured and sold into slavery and uh, other horrible things happened to these poor children. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a bad thing all around. Next one, number four, alchemy. Alchemy is an interesting, a very interesting topic because, I mean, it was a forerunner of chemistry, but it was in days when people didn't really understand chemical reactions or atomic structure or anything like that. So it was a, a way of applying superstition to science. And alchemy also does factor into a number of uh, steampunk books where we have uh, science working a little bit differently for the sake of fiction. One of my favorites, and it might be debated whether this is steampunk, is Brandon Sanderson's Alloy of Law, in which they have kind of a, an, a Wild West slash Victorian society in which uh, these alchemists have these powers to uh, affect various, you know, these magical powers to affect affect various chemicals or metals or whatever. Pretty pretty interesting, pretty interesting book. McKay's section on alchemy, it focuses on efforts to turn um, base metals, which is things like lead and uh, mercury, into gold. And McKay notes that many of these practitioners believed in this. They really, they really were deluded and they thought it could be done if they could just find the right formula. And a lot of them happened to get the sponsorship of wealthy nobles who figured they could have their own gold factory if they got it, got it right. The problem with that is that um, they, if a nobleman got the idea that this guy wasn't motivated enough, he might just imprison this poor alchemist in the tower until he could find out a way of producing gold. And of course, as we know, it can't happen. So, uh, so it was kind of a life sentence for these poor guys. And of course, alchemy ended in, in its popularity actually as late as the 17, late 1700s. There were still people who believed in it, but once the scientific method became more uh, originally ingrained and people were able to verify that no, there was no way to transmute an element uh, short of bombarding it with, with uh, protons, which is something we didn't know until the 20th century. So uh, alchemy essentially died, but it's still still has fun aspects of it in fiction, including steampunk. Next one, uh, uh, number five, uh, duels and ordeals. And these two things were, he, McKay put them into one chapter because he doesn't, he doesn't give them very much attention. I think they probably should have had each their own chapter and, and more attention because this is kind of fascinating. Dueling is something that was um, still practiced at um, still practiced in the 1800s, and so it it can enter into a lot of steampunk stories. As a matter of fact, one of my historical characters in my Fidelius Automata book was the Marquis de Morris, Antoine Vallombrosa, uh, or Vallombrosa, who was a French uh, nobleman who uh, uh, fought several duels. So he was kind of a quarrelsome guy, and, and uh, obviously he won until his death in a, in a kind of an ill-conceived um, adventure in North Africa in uh, the late 1800s. So duels, duels, of course, were very popular for a while, and it seemed like everybody, including you know college students in Germany, would would, would challenge each other to a duel at the slightest offense. And you know it would end up normally end up with somebody being killed. Not always, but but quite frequently, you know, by swords or pistols or whatever. And and various political entities sought to ban dueling. Uh, different cardinals uh, prescribed excommunication for duelers, for duelists, and uh, it was severely punished. It it took quite a while before it was finally mostly eliminated. Who knows if, you know, it seems like some of these um, gangsters, like some of the feuds that they have are almost kind of a duel type of, type of situation. That's, people are prideful, especially men. <laughs> and uh, so it'll probably never go away completely. 
And with this, he ties into the idea of trial by ordeal, which is the idea that you could have some kind of a random, um, random test that would pr produce a person's guilt or innocence because supposedly God would intervene. And uh, so if you remember uh, Monty Python's Holy Grail, the, uh, when they throw a woman in the water saying, if she floats, <laughs> if she floats, she's, she's a witch, and if she sinks, she's innocent, but she drowns. <laughs> so, and then, of course, they say, no, she's not a witch, she's a duck. <laughs> but anyway, that kind of thing was frequently practiced. And so in that, in that, in that case, the duel, duel by water, per, typically the person would die either way. <laughs> and there was another ordeal that involved sticking your arm into boiling water. And you got three days for your arm to heal up. And if it didn't, you were guilty of whatever it was. And priests thought up this really, really clever one so that they could always, always pass. And it was involved eating some consecrated food and supposedly, if they had been lying, God would uh, see that, make their throat seize up, and they wouldn't be able to swallow. So, there was nothing ever happened, never happened, never was a priest convicted on, <laughs> on this type of trial. Number six, slow poisoning. This is one of the more fascinating one because I, ones, because I hadn't really heard much about this, but... Uh, at, in the um, 1600s in particular, uh, it was really, really popular, uh, or should I say notorious, for people to poison their enemies. And this is something, you know, this kind of skullduggery, you know, this, is, this appears in a lot of works of fiction too, and, and as far as I know, it's probably been in steampunk as well, uh, though I can't think of any examples. But the Mackays, uh, he devotes about half the chapter to talking about Sir Thomas Overbury, who was uh, this um, aristocrat who in 1613 was poisoned and killed while in prison. And about the conspiracy, you know, they had, supposedly they were going to just lock him up for a short time, but they had uh, put poison in his food so that he died because, uh, you know, he had enemies. He had powerful enemies. Now, there was at the same time, there was this spate of poisoning women from, you know, from upper levels to middle class were confessing to their priests that they had murdered their husbands by poison. <clears throat> and this was a thing that they would do, because if you had a poison that was, was uh, kind of um, not so severe that they would, they could, you could have this poison night after night and eventually develop an illness. And because medical science wasn't developed at the time and because coroners couldn't tell some of these poisons, these guys would die and they'd think it was natural causes. And so since they, the women couldn't divorce their husbands at that time in Catholic Italy, it was a good, good way to get the guy out of the way so maybe they can marry their young lover. Um, and uh, there were other cases where it was like political. Like there was a woman, Madame de Brinvilliers of France, who was, who was partly poisoning people on behalf of, of her lover and, and uh, you know, people he wanted out of the way. And, and at the end, hundreds of people were executed for, for killing people by poisoning, and probably many hundreds escaped, escaped um, conviction. And, uh, you know, eventually it fell out of fashion, but who knows? You better, sometimes you better have your food tested. <laughs> Number seven, and this is one that's kind of, it's very funny to end this on a more cheerful note. It's something that's pretty well harmless. And uh, McKay was also interested in fads and fancies of the, of the public. And this chapter was called Popular Follies in Great Cities. And for the most part, he's just talking about weird expressions that people came up with in London that would just appear out of nowhere and then just disappear. Uh, and nobody knew where they came from or who coined them. You know, around that time when there was no social media and no way of, of it was not recorded anywhere. For example, he talks about the word quaz. The word quaz suddenly appeared. People would say, quaz! It's kind of a, a, an exclamation. And uh, suddenly it was in fashion and out of fashion. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of funny. It's kind of fun because we can use these expressions in steampunk. Definitely the historical um, air and atmosphere to our work. Another one, another funny one was, there he goes with his eye out. I don't know what that means. It just certainly sounds like maybe he's like staring at people or, or ogling women or whatever, but... 
And it's kind of a funny picture, a gruesome picture. And uh, the, the most interesting one was uh, something that was more, more than just an expression. Uh, but people would say, if they saw a hat, because everybody wore hats, of course, people would say, what a shocking bad hat! And, uh, it, you know, so they'd insult people's hats right on the street. And if it was a really, really bad hat, somebody would grab it and they'd uh, pass it around and throw in the mud and stomp on it. <laughs> so they, and they'd all laugh. <laughs> so it was like, it was like a way to pull kind of a mean prank on somebody uh, because this was such a fad. And again, it just, it passed. It was there for a while and it passed. And it, it, this kind of reminded me of Anubis Gates, uh, the great steampunk book Anubis Gates by, what is it, Tim Price? Uh, where it incorporated some of the Victorian folklore and urban legends into the book. Like there was this guy that walked on, uh, what is it, spring Hill Jack? He supposedly had springs in his shoes and he would like murder people. So he made spring Hill Jack into a character in the book, which made it pretty interesting. It had some really bizarre stuff going on. So that is it. I've been talking about the book, the historical book, uh, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds by Charles McKay, first published in London in 1841. Still relevant today. Still relevant today because people believe a lot of things that aren't true and, they, and these, these rumors spread like crazy and, and sometimes we have negative results from them. As far as the book, I would definitely rate it 5 out of 5 gears. It's kind of long, but I don't mind it being long if you've got you know, something of interest, his circle interest like this. I think it's fa fabulous, fabulous. So let me know in the comments below what you thought about this episode, whether you liked it, whether you didn't like it, whether you'd like to see more or less of this sort of historical topic. Please also like and subscribe. That will help us to get out the word about the wonders of steampunk and the study of history. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.